Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back again with a uh, supporter questions from my supporters on Patreon. We didn't really do it in June because I was in Hawaii and I was trying to log into my Patreon and that meant that I needed to have SMS on my phone and because I was on Wi-Fi, I wasn't getting it. Anyway, look, doesn't matter. Still having lots of amazing questions and we're going to start with uh, Van Henning Ebenson. Hi Scott, thanks for all your engaging and well-researched science videos, except this one which I make up the answers on the spot. I have a and a for your AMA in the Apollo missions. If I'm not mistaken, the trip back from the moon was much quicker than the trip to the moon. Why is that? If the moon weren't there, wouldn't it take the same amount of time to get up as it does to get down? Did they effectively get a gravity assist from the moon? Oh wow, okay. This is a good one because I have absolutely no idea and now I want to make a... I want to do some research and make a video. Um, I didn't realise that there's a different time, but yeah, I, I would have actually... If you'd asked me, I would have said the outbound times would have been faster because I know that to do the uh, free return trajectory, your apogee is actually past the moon so that you sort of swing by and then uh, get pulled around by the moon onto your exact trajectory. So I thought that would have been faster. So why would it be faster on the way back? Are you sure? <laughs> um, so let me, let me think about this. If you've got something around the moon, then the... Okay, so when you're coming back, you obviously have more fuel. So sure, maybe they go faster because of that. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, there probably was some constraint on the time. Maybe the moon was... No, well, okay, so the moon does change distance during its orbit, so... Yeah, that doesn't seem to make sense either, because they were only there for like a week or so, so... It, it wouldn't... They wouldn't always be coming closer, right? So the moon's orbit ch is eccentric and so it changes distance. But I think between all the different Apollo site, uh, flights, you would have some which were closer than the others. Um... Yeah, they should all take the same amount of time to come back, you know, barring the change in the lunar distance, to come back to the perigee. But, 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 right, okay, so wait a second, their descent trajectory had to be in the daylight always over the Pacific. So their timing had to be such that when they left the moon, they would always end up over the Pacific. And the time to get from the Moon to the Earth is going to have a certain maximum. And so if that maximum meant that uh, you weren't over the Pacific in daylight when you hit it, you would have to go earlier and earlier until your perigee hits the Pacific over daylight. And I bet you that's what it is. I'm going to actually do some research and find this out because I'm now really interested. Um, totally speculating that on... Anyway, thanks for that. That's a really good question. I, I, anyway, Ryan Cady. Hi, Scott. As a software engineer, I'm really interested in learning more about how software contributes to space technology. I'm particularly interested in knowing if there is an open source community for space software that actually gets used in real missions. Yes, there is open source software being used on real missions. Right now, Ingenuity is full of open source software, as is uh, Perseverance. Yeah, I know for a fact that they have, think, I think they have FFmpeg and Image Magic and other open source software, and they're running Linux on some of them. Like, so Perseverance has like a core mission computer, but it also has like a data handling computer, which runs Linux. So yeah, Linux is turning up everywhere, and so do the report related open source tools. There's some other tools that you can uh, work on. There's Open Mission Control, which is like a mission control software, which is open source, and it integrates with Kerbal Space Program just in case you want to simulate your missions in Kerbal first. Uh, there's GMAT, that's the general, uh, what is it, GNU, as a mission analysis tool. It's basically a way of plotting orbits and planning your missions, uh, you know, doing, figuring out your injections and your different trajectories. So GMAT, and I tell you what, I've used that, and if somebody out there can fix the rendering performance on the XY plots, it, it's horrific if you want to do really long plot. It just grinds to a halt and gets stuck in a loop. Yes, uh, open source software is everywhere these days, and it's well worth your time developing it. Uh, I never really did that much computer science. My hiring into tech jobs was largely on the strength of my work on open source software, which is a great way to get seen out there. 
John S. Hello, Scott. Since you seem to have a fair bit of knowledge on nuclear processes, I'm wondering if you could help me with a question on the universe and also sci-fi. Uh, I was also wondering, could you speculate how the fundamental constants of the universe could be tweaked to make more elements without making the universe too unrecognisable for us? I'm sorry, but like... I, all I know is that every time people look at changed physical constants, the universe fails in some horrific way. Uh, <laughs> like, the only example I've seen of a fundamental physical constant being changed and not destroying the universe uh, is the weakless universe, which is like a thought experiment where essentially weak nuclear decay doesn't happen uh, and so you, you can still have a universe that forms with different timescales. Uh, but I, I would be very careful about changing any physical constants, except, no, no you know what, you, if you change gravity, then bad things happen everywhere as well, because your timelines for stars and, you know, uh, formation, every, you know, if you tweak the constant of gravity just a little with the same universe, then everything ends up in black holes, right? <laughs> or, or ends up with just like clouds of dust everywhere. Yeah, um, careful if you have godlike power, seriously. Okay, Cuba has a very short question. Following up on episode number five, trebuchets on the moon. I'm not sure what to follow up with other than, uh, yeah, it would be cool if you could actually build a trebuchet in the moon, right? So let me, let me just say, you can, if you think about it, a trebuchet as a device for converting the potential energy for a big you know, counterweight mass into kinetic energy for the payload. So if you make your, you know, counterweight heavy enough, you can do the math that it falls this distance, and if you then take that mass and that potential energy and put it into kinetic energy on this, then it could, in theory, exceed escape velocity or orbital velocity. The problem is, is you need a device to do this, and you have to have this long, uh, sp you know, spar, uh, and then you need the weights and the bearings, and uh, you probably need like another uh, flexible thing. Point is, I'm sure you could actually do the math to make sure that the energy in this is enough to include the rotation of this whole uh, pivot and still have enough left over for this thing to reach orbit. But yeah, that's another thing I should probably do a video on at some point, huh? Lone Wolf 201011, could a Falcon Heavy carry a 1 to 2 Tesla magnet to Mars L1 point to create an artificial magnetosphere for Mars colonization? Okay, and I know about this because I watched this. So when you say a 1 to 2 Tesla magnet, here's the thing, Tesla is just like a point measure of magnetic field strength. And you can actually buy a 1 to 2 Tesla magnet like on the internet for a few thousand dollars. But what it is, it's like a C-shaped magnet where the two poles are really close together. And in that tiny gap, there is a one to two Tesla magnetic field and danger <laughs> like for, for anything that goes in there. But to build a magnetic field for a planet, you want like a torus, a toroidal donut magnetic field that is, is large enough to deflect the solar wind. And um, I'm not sure how big that would be, but I do remember a reading a paper that I think it was actually shared by Winchell Chung again um, about, you know, hard at science fiction and everything. And this was a study basically saying that counterintuitively, if you have a toroidal shaped magnet and you're trying to get a planetary scale magnetic field, the amount of materials you need actually goes down as you make it wider. Right, so if you want to make a, a magnetic field strong enough to protect Mars, I think the smallest size is something like 10 kilometers. And I remember them saying that if you wanted to get the rare Earth materials to create the superconductors needed for one of these magnets, you would have to mine like the whole of the planet Mars or something ridiculous like that. Because we know how common rare Earth elements are in the solar system. And therefore, you know how much ore you have to get through on average to find them. Now, the, their next step was to say, but if you scale this Taurus up to like the size of the planet Mars and just have a, a loop running around Mars, then it's something like, oh, you mine the whole of Olympus Mons and then you get enough materials for this. So as for Falcon Heavy being able to do that, yes, it could fly to a, a one to two Tesla magnet up there, but it wouldn't be able to protect Mars, right? 
Nathan C. Hey Scott, after watching For All Mankind and the Sea Dragon launch, I was doing some research on the engine used for this big dumb booster. They were planned to use a single engine fueled by RP-1 and LOX, and it was pressure fed as well. Which would have been 23 metres, yes 23 metres, in diameter, and putting out 79 million pounds of thrust. Could an engine like that ever be built with current materials available without tearing itself apart? Um, so yes. Yes, uh, you could actually build an engine that size with current materials because Robert Truax did the math and, and the reasoning behind Sea Dragon is always interesting. Robert Truax designed, did a lot of work on rocket design and his observation was that there was a continual effort to shrink rockets down to make them more useful and uh, he sort of noticed that as they shrunk the rockets down, the cost got more expensive. And so he sort of drew this line through the costs and said, well, wait a second, what happens if we went the other way and built a giant big dumb booster? And his that was his argument for Sea Dragon. Now, his engine was going to be pressure fed, uh, kerosene, liquid oxygen. They would actually generate the liquid oxygen on site using like a, an aircraft carrier with a nuclear reactor. And I would say if you had a 23 meter engine, that combustion instability would absolutely be terrible, right? It would destroy, you know, they had these problems with the F1 engines on the Saturn V and they would build up these combustion instabilities inside it that would destroy the engine. And those engines were not anywhere near this size. But those used like a spray head type injector uh, you know, lots of, in you know, lots of holes. Uh, in, what do you even call them? Uh, jet, jet, uh, impinging jet injectors, right? And they uh, had to include baffles and stuff to suppress any waves that were being built up. Now, the Sea Dragon was supposed to use a pintle style injector, which is what's used in the Falcon 9's Merlin engine, and that has like a pair of coaxial. Uh, pipes and one sprays outwards into the other and that's how they're supposed to mix and according to fans of pintle injectors including Tom Muller who built the Merlin engine for SpaceX these things are much more stable and don't suffer from any of these problems and he personally said don't worry Sea Dragon would be totally stable so cool I guess there is I actually got given uh, Robert Truex's autobiography and the intro to that is interesting because it talks about a sea dragon, but it's a different design than what I've seen elsewhere because the second stage is now liquid hydrogen. It's still massive. It still puts tons into orbit, but it can also get stuff to the moon. Anyway, uh, yeah, let's get on to Eric Wolf. Hi, Scott. Thanks for answering my question in your fifth. Wait, are you getting two questions answered? Oh, dear. You people. Great insight as always. I have another. Are there any non-hydrolox engines that insulate their tanks? I suspect the reason hydrogen tanks are insulated because a boil off would be excessive. The weight penalty is worth avoiding for the performance loss. Blah, blah, blah. I, I, I don't actually know because I haven't done the math. But yeah, generally you'll only find the hydrogen tanks are the ones that are insulated. And like on the... Uh, Saturn V, the insulation was actually on the inside of the tank, but nowadays it's more common to just have like spray on foam insulation on the outside, like on these. Now, um, you'll, you'll also find like the Centaurs, they have, uh, they have a very thin side and they don't worry about insulation. They have panels on the outside, but they're, they're not, uh, they're not doing a big deal about that. But yeah, look, you'll find insulated tanks for all sorts of applications. First of all, if you have storable propellants in space, you're gonna to want to insulate them against cold so they don't you know, like actually freeze. And uh, uh, I was gonna say like the lunar module here, you can just, you know, make out, you've, you've got that gold foil on there. A lot of that was insulation. They have multi-layer insulation on the surface to keep the tanks warm enough so that they don't cool down or cold enough depending upon the requirements. Um, yeah, there's lots of processes for, for insulation. If you look at the recent launch of Astra's rocket, it looked like they had insulation over their second stage as well. So, yeah, it, it just comes down to the engineering as to whether it's needed. And in most cases, if you're just using liquid oxygen, liquid methane, you can just handle the ice on the outside and have it break off during the launch. You'll also see, by the way, things like the Ariane and the Long March, where they use 
foam uh, foam panels on the outside of the rockets to protect these very cold areas and stop condensation forming. And as soon as these lift off, you'll see these things falling off. And every time that happens, someone's like, oh, oh the rocket's falling apart. It's like, nope, that's as design. Okay, uh, Seddon of Wikipedia. How much Delta V would it take to get from the ISS to the new Chinese space station? And could any future planned vehicle make that trip? So there is about a 10 degree difference between the Chinese space station and the International Space Station, right? But, and so, but, but here's the thing, that's the inclination difference. You can also have a difference in the longitude of the ascending node. So they could equally be like at opposite sides of the Earth and having like a hundred degree difference in their inclination. But um, assuming perfect, the closest alignment you could get, that would be a 10 degree difference. So what you do is you take the sine of 10 degrees, which is, I don't know, small, multiply that by your orbital velocity of about 7.5 kilometers, and it'll, pro it'll probably tell you, you need about one and a half kilometers per second of delta V to go from one to the other. And there is a vehicle that's definitely capable of doing this. It's the Falcon 9, although you would need the Falcon 9 upper stage to get to space with a lot of propellant. I don't see any mission really going between them, but 1.3 kilometers per second of Delta V actually uh, is well within the capabilities of what the X-37B supposedly has. It has. It was originally going to have three kilometers per second of Delta V when it was a civilian vehicle. And there's not many reasons to suspect they might have changed that when it became a, a sort of secret project. So yeah, I guess the X-37 could switch orbit between the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station when the orbits are sufficiently closely aligned. Um, finally, I think we're getting on for like 20 minutes or so. Roland Warmerdam. Was the space shuttle capable of returning payloads from orbit, like bringing back the Hubble Space Telescope to place it in a museum, or would the extra weight have made re-entry too toasty? So, the space shuttle was absolutely designed to land with heavy payloads in its payload bay. I'm just not sure about the exact limit and whether the Hubble Space Telescope qualified, but there were several cases where it picked up things in space, like the long duration exposure facility, and uh, there was a satellite that they stowed in the cargo bay and brought back to Earth carefully. Um, but even then, there was quite a few missions where the space shuttle would go up with a fairly hefty piece of hardware in its payload bay, and it was designed to then come back and land with that. So you have things like Space Hab, where you would have a bunch of scientists doing work in the back. A lot of people think that when the shuttle went up there, they would launch stuff out of the cargo bay and the scientists would do all their work on the flight deck. No, the, you could you would actually have like a lab that they would load into the back and you could travel down like a little passageway and get in there. And that would be where most of the research was actually done while on orbit. And this thing would weigh like, you know, probably five tons at least. So yeah, space shuttle could land with something fairly substantial in there. It, I actually, I don't think the limit was the re-entry, uh, the thermal protection system. I think the limits would simply be gliding and landing at those speeds. And, and that's why they, they didn't do it very often. Um, the heaviest landing was probably like, I think it was a mission where they had Space Hab on board and then they had fuel cell limits, uh, fuel cell problems, and they had to cut the mission short. So not only did they have extra payload, they also had a lot of consumables still on board, and so that would have probably put their landing mass up to a fair amount. But I don't know what the exact number is, but it's a lot heavier than any spacecraft flying right now. So yeah, thanks for all your questions, and now, now I'm gonna have to take a look at that uh, Apollo video now. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.